His hair was fading from the sides, and his arms were swollen in the joints, and he was very thin in body. Body fat was now wasting away, and muscle tissue was evaporating. This man lay there by himself, quarantined away from any other patient. It was 1996, no, it was 1989, and I was on a rotation at the Howard University Hospital, and they didn't know quite what was wrong with him. They'd seen instances of this in different parts of the United States, but they didn't quite know what was going on. Reports had come from San Francisco of similar ailments, ailments. White males who were finding themselves in emergency rooms with their bodies wasting away. What is going on? I walked into another room and I saw her in Lusaka, Zambia, laying in a bed, her eyes fluorescent yellow and her body like saran wrapped around toothpicks. She lay there coughing up spit the color of blood. The question was, what is going on? Opened up the newspaper and there I discovered the story of a priest who now finds himself hiding because the police are now looking for him after a long trail of young boys who come with tales of how they lost their manhood and their innocence because he raped them repeatedly as they trusted him as a spiritual leader. The question is, what is going on? The first instance in 1989 was the gay male who found himself plagued with HIV. The second instance in 2007 was a young lady in Lusaka, Zambia, who was ravaged by AIDS. The third instance, a result of homosexual predators who found themselves hiding in the priesthood, now using their power to be pedophiles and exploiting young boys. Well, well these are stories that took place years ago. Mercy. Two years ago, we heard about a young boy who found himself, lost his natural mind, went into an high school, opened the doors, and with an M16, lit up the place, killing young boys, then returned home, killed his own mother, and then turned the gun on himself. We cannot ignore these things any longer. The question is, what is going on? Marvin Gaye sang a song one time, and he was asked the same question. What's going on? Somebody ought to say it. But the Bible has not left us to ask Marvin Gaye for the answer. Jesus himself has come with a response, and he has not left us in the dark as we try to grapple with the stories about what's taking place in our earth's history. We will turn to the word of God because there we will discover what, come on somebody, is going on. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray and invite the Holy Spirit here today. Our God and our Father, we are confused as we try to figure out the tea leaves of time around us. Many are turning to psychics, others are turning to apostate Protestants, others are turning to miracle workers who can only give them confusing tales. But Lord, this is not new to you. You've given us the sure word of prophecy and the Bible to let us know clearly what is going on. As we begin our series and begin to discover what's going on and how to prepare for what's about to happen, we turn this completely over to you, that we may hear your voice and see your faith and get your answers from your Bible and the Bible alone. Amen. Thank you for what you're about to do. In the hearts of those who come underneath of the power of the Holy Ghost. And when it's all said and done, we'll give you all the honor, yes, all the glory, and all of the praise. Let everybody yes. say, yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. The Bible is very clear. Yes. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. It is very clear that something strange is taking place on the face of the world. One of the problems that I've discovered, though, is that you can get used to things and lose your awareness right. that things are getting better. Yeah. 
I remember when I used to get, uh, get a bath when I was a young boy, and, and I used to love getting baths. We didn't have showers back there where I was, so we used to have to fill the tub up with water. And so I turned on the hot water, and I liked it very, 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 very really hot. But what I noticed sometimes, it was too hot, but I, I have to inch my foot into the water. Anyone ever tried that? <laughs> but, but, but initially, it would burn me, almost scald me, but I eventually would put my foot in, and it will get used to it. And it wouldn't be long before I could put both feet in, and then settle down and rest in a hot tub of water, and it wouldn't burn. You know, sin is something like that. You can slowly become accustomed to things that are originally that would have burned your conscience and shut your awareness, but after a period of time, you become so comfortable that you can sit and lay right in sin and confusion and not be alone. Well, the Bible gives us a shocking portrayal in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, when... There will be very difficult times. No one can argue with that today. We are in difficult times. He goes on farther to explain what does he mean. For people will love only themselves and their money. Now I know that doesn't take place here on Nations Fellowship Church or out in the Downers Grove neighborhood, but people become lovers of only themselves and their money. I've heard of people who will see their parents sick and try to negotiate ways to put that parent out of their misery prematurely so they can get the inheritance. All right, now. I know of a case, honestly, I know of a case personally where a young lady was given the deeds to a house with the elder parents saying that I just want to put you on the deeds so that when you when I die, you don't have to pay a death tax. <laughs> this young woman, not even the first child of the lady, she's a niece who she took in and allowed her to live with her for years, got high on her horse one day and went to the old lady and said, you know what, I want out of this deed. And the old lady says, but when I die, you get the whole house. She says, no, according to the law, if I take this house to court right now, I can actually force a sale, and I get my share, and you have to take your share. She threatened the old lady to the extent that the old lady had to then sell her portion of the house to somebody and give, sell the other portion of the house to someone else and pay the young lady off so that she can go free. She took $700,000 cash and went along her way. People will become what? The more lovers of themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. Of course, we've seen the scientists who now say that God is dead. Jesus. Not only does the scientists say that, but the society has been so made sick that they even believe that there's no such thing as God. How do we know that? Because people think they can live and do what they want to do. They have no accountability. People don't recognize that one day there will come a judgment. That's right. That's right. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. Well, I don't need to say anything else about that. Somebody ought to say it. All right. yes. Amen. They will consider nothing sacred. Right now, the government of the United States passed a law that said a man is passing legislation that is seeking to allow a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. Nothing is sacred. Two great institutions that God had established in the Garden of Eden to preserve a sense of the sacred. One was marriage. That only a man and a woman who can fit together and complement themselves should make a sacred union that should never be broken. Amen. Now we live in such difficult times that these conditions may have to be renegotiated. But remember that God's ideal is that marriage is sacred. Yeah. That's right. And as a marriage is sacred and God has time to celebrate marriage, he also has married us. Not only did he create us, but he redeemed us. And you know, God wants to celebrate his marriage every week that he set aside a sacred time and a sacred day. The seventh day Sabbath is the second institution created in the Garden of Eden, and that was designed to be sacred. Well, we've seen Satan 
who has confused the whole world that he's taken that day and reduced it to merely a shopping day or a day to sleep. Right. Nothing is sacred. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Jesus. Stay away from people like that. All right. Tell us, please. They will act religious, but deny the power thereof. The, one of the greatest confusions in the world, why people don't like to come to church, is because many people in church are frauds. That's right. They act religious, but don't have access to a power that allows them to be godly and loving. This is a sign of the last day. Well, friends, this isn't new. Somebody says, well, what's really going on? The Bible has not left us ignorant of that either. This is not a battle that takes place in the minds and the hands of men. No, this battle started a long time ago, and our key text that we started with this week in Revelation chapter 12, what book did I say? Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we will see there in verse 7 to 9, that this is nothing new. This big melodrama that is being played out before mankind started a long time ago in the courts of heaven. There was one, his name was Lucifer. This was an angel. Many people don't believe in angels today, but angels are real. As a matter of fact, not only are they real, they're present here today as we are preaching and speaking. They are engaged in battle warfare between demons and angels over your very soul. And the Bible is very clear that this war that started a long time ago started when Lucifer, an archangel that was the most beautiful of all creatures, was there engaged in heaven leading choirs and leading uh, 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 angels to do the, and dispatch the responsibilities of God. But you know, when you get a little something, it's sometimes not enough. <laughs> a mystery took place in the heart of Lucifer. We call it the mystery of iniquity. Somehow or the other, being the first and the best and the brightest and the most beautiful was not enough. For there was one that was a star far greater than him. There was one who shone more brilliantly. There was one who was not just an angel, but he was God and equal to God and had private conversations with God. His name was Michael. We call him Jesus. Some call him the Christ. Some call him the everlasting, star, uh, the everlasting father. But we know him as Jesus. In the Bible, referred to as an angel, his name was Michael. Michael holds private conversations with God and, and was being revealed certain wonderful plans of redemption. But Lucifer was on the outside, and somehow or the other, that did not satisfy good old Lucifer. Jealous and envious, he began to see that God had restricted him and limited his access to information. And so he decided he would spread rumors about God. You know, sometimes if you want to mess a person up, you don't have to confront them right in their face. You just have to spread rumors. You, if you don't like the elder, you don't have to go and confront him. You just have to spread rumors. If you don't like your boss, you don't have to confront him. You can just spread rumors. If you don't like the pastor, you don't have to go up in his face. You just have to spread rumors. Now, I know that doesn't take place here in the whole nation. <laughs> But all you have to do is start spreading rumors. Do you know a lie sticks more than the truth? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, if you want to get something to go around, you just start it. A lie will stick so much better than the truth. Well, Lucifer, there in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against this dragon and his angel. That's Lucifer. Now, Lucifer was spreading rumors saying that God cannot be trusted and that God's way of doing things is totally wrong. This same Lucifer that has caused patients to be in hospital with lymph nodes swollen and coughing up blood, male boys being exploited by homosexual priests. This same Lucifer that causes boys to turn against their parents and girls to want to marry girls and boys to want to marry boys. This same Lucifer started his battle in heaven. And the two principles that Lucifer extols are these. Do not trust God All right. and disobey his commandments. There are two things that the Lucifer, he only has two games in town, and that's what makes this miracle series so important. We want to give you a power so that you can trust God, and a power so that you can keep his commandments. 
The devil has been so sophisticated that when he was in heaven, he led not just some angels. One writer says he convinced all angels that God cannot be trusted, and he set about starting a rebellion to disobey God's moral law. But there was one named Michael mm. who stood up yes, sir. and said, enough is enough. Mm. You know, sometimes a man needs to stand up yes. and say, enough yes. is enough. Yes. Well, Michael was the man in heaven. He had to defend his father's reputation and put his foot on down. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. I wish we had some more men around who would stand up and say enough is enough. Amen. I wish we had more Christians who would stand up and put their foot down and say enough is enough. Amen. While Lucifer, now deceiving the angels, was now engaged in a verbal battle. And they got to the point where Lucifer had to decide what you're going to do. Two-thirds of the angels stuck with Michael. One-third of the angels went to Lucifer. But the Bible says, and the dragon and his angels lost the battle. Somebody should amen. say amen. Because if he can lose the battle up there, I believe it's going to lose the battle down here. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one that is deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. That's important. Before the very same demon, devil, Lucifer, the most intelligent of all creations, that was raised in heaven, in heaven is now here on earth going about his business. All right. That's right. You ought to know that there are such things as demons and angels. Yes. There is a God and there's a devil. Yes. And there's still a battle between Michael and Lucifer going on here today. As a matter of fact, the decisions that you make every day are influenced by either Lucifer or Michael. The battle is not with M16s and, uh, and, 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 and big airplanes. The battle is with decisions and choices that you make every day. Even further than that, that battle is between the nature of the flesh and the nature of the spirit. The battle that took place in heaven is taking place in you right now. And it's going to take a miracle for you to have victory in that battle. Yes. Turn with me, if you will, for the Bible will show you that this battle which sought and confused people, God revealed it to one man in the book, in the book of Daniel. For nations will be confused between nations. They'll go to battle against each other. Daniel chapter 2, we see in verse 19, it's here we see a secret being revealed. You want to know what's going on? Well, you need to know the secret. So this week, we're going to talk about the secret and the miracle. A king, Nebuchadnezzar, was laying in his bed. And now some of us lay in their bed, and they wake up with dreams. Well, these dreams sometimes that you have is because you ate too much before you went to sleep. <laughs> Somebody ought to say amen. You know that. You didn't have no Holy Ghost prophecy dream. <laughs> that dream was because you ate that, that cheesecake. Okay. And you know, you should eat some stuff you shouldn't. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to touch your favorite dessert. But some of us were laying out eating too much and we broke up in nightmares. No. In the Bible days, dreams actually meant something. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, was the king of all of Babylon. Babylon was the most dominant nation in the entire world. Not just was it dominant, but Babylon was rich. This king had all the money and all of the power. And now being in great position of power, God wanted to let him know who was really in power. All right. See, the great deception of Lucifer is he gives you the false security that you're really in control. All right. The great lie of Lucifer is that you really are the man. You know, you're driving nice, you're looking good, and, and things seem like they're working out for you, but that is often a great deception. You are not in control. Laying there late one night, after reading his books and counting his money, he laid in his bed and was riveted with a big picture in his mind. It was an image that he could not recall. It was a dream that seemed to terrify him. Broke out in sweat, woke up shaking, and called his wise men. Please, somebody tell me my dream, and then interpret it. Now, let's be honest. <laughs> it's one thing to have a nightmare and get me to interpret it. I, you know, I might be able to work with it. But it's another thing to have a nightmare and ask me, what was my nightmare? 
Right. I don't know what was your night. I didn't even know what you ate last night. Right. Right. So the king now put a miracle, <laughs> and quite looking for a miracle that these magicians just could not do. There are some miracles that only God can do. Yes. There are some miracles that cannot be taken place by anybody else but God. Yes. The greatest miracle that can take place and only God can do it is to transform your life. Yes. Well, this miracle, particularly in question, could not be completed by these wise men. And so the king sent out an edict where he said he's going to kill everybody. You know, these old time kings, they were kind of, it was in Saddam Hussein's country. <laughs> so you know. This wasn't a play thing. All right. When these kings said we're going to kill everybody, they were, they were making hands throw. We've seen the stories about Saddam Hussein and how he killed people who went against his kingdom. That's right. We've seen stories of Hitler who wasted no bullets or no time he would kill. People controlled by Lucifer have no regard for the sacredness of life and they will kill. Yes. All right. Shaking in their boots, the wise men didn't know what to do. The word went out to all the kingdom. But do you know that God had somebody yeah. in the kingdom, in the lowest position, who was called upon to answer this question? You don't know why God has you here today. Mercy. Yeah. You don't know why God wants to veil before you the secret and give you access to a miracle. Right. You don't know how God is going to use you. Right. Three more. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yea, four. These were slaves that were being kept in control in Babylon. Now, they didn't know why God would call them, and you don't know why God has called you. You look at your situation sometimes and count yourself out. You're ripping yourself off. You're walking your head down. But God may have you in the bottom because he may use the bottom to confuse the top. He often takes the foolish to confuse the wise. He often takes the weak to bind the strong. You ought to say, thank you, God, for your position. Because God can take any position and use it for his glory. Amen. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the doors were beaten upon. As they came and looked up, wiping sleep from their face, the guards were opening. They, they need you, they need you. And he said, what's going on? There is an edict that everyone shall be killed. For what? The king has lost his natural mind. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. What, what's the problem? Well, he has a secret. And, and he wants to know, uh, can you tell him his dream and also interpret it? Now, you know, we have potions that we can put together and give him to drink. He doesn't want to drink anything. We have medicine we can give him to recreate. He, doesn't, he wants us to come up with the dream and interpret it. Well, Daniel said that I cannot tell him the dream and I cannot interpret it. But I know somebody yes. who knows somebody yes. who knows they can interpret any dream and reveal any mystery. I want you to know today, church, that I know somebody, yes. and I know somebody that knows somebody yes. who can unveil any secret and perform any miracle. Yes. If there's somebody here today that's got a problem in your mind and you can't solve it, I know somebody. Yes. If there's somebody here that's got a sickness that cannot be healed, I know somebody. Yes. If there's somebody here that's financially strapped and wrapped and, kind of, and feel like you're jacked, well, I know somebody who's still able to perform miracles and find the answers to mysteries. This man now calls uh, Daniel forward, and the king says, well, you know somebody. Well, I, I can't do it, king. Don't get it twisted. I take it no glory. You know, that's the first thing we ought to start doing, church. That's right, that's right. You ought to start getting real. You can't take glory for the blessings that you got. One of the reasons why our blessings get blocked is because we have not given true credit to the one who has given us our blessings. You're driving nice by not telling anybody that it's God that's giving give you the gas in the car. You know you roll up to the tank on E and hoping that God will take E and make it F. <laughs> because fool comes after eat. Stay, stay. You right, messed it. You right. messed it. You messed it. You messed it. You messed it. God has been stretching your gas That's from E to F. Yes. So there we see him now standing before the king. And the king says, well, 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 go and do what you got to do. And now Daniel returns and he says, I know the secret. That night the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Very important. Whenever God blesses you, you ought to start praising him. Yeah. There are some people here that's already had some secrets revealed. Yeah. 
Some people here that's already had miracles in their life, but you haven't started to praise God for what he's done. And that's the reason why the miracles stop. Because God doesn't do miracles for you. He does miracles to bring him glory and also uplift other people. The, the revealing of the dream was to bring glory to God and to teach other people about the power of the true and living God. The miracles that are going to take place over the next three weeks in your life are not for you. They're designed so that you can bring God glory and also uplift humanity. Amen. You ought to start giving God some praise right now. You know who ought to stop you crying and go to sing and talk and walk and you should be where you are. You know God has healed you from a sickness. God's put money in your pocket. He's put clothes on your back. He's put running in your feet. He's put food on your table. But we have forgotten to give God all the glory. But now we will see what actually happened in that dream. That was the dream. Now we will tell you the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. So what did he dream? He dreamed of a great image. And this image was the shape of a man. It had a head of gold. It had a body that was made out of bronze. It had a waist made out of a silver. A waist made out of bronze. Legs made out of iron and feet made out of iron and clay. This thing that was shaped like a man had significance. Each one of those metals that it was made out of deteriorated in value. What does that mean? Each kingdom that will come from the time of Babylon straight down to now will be a weaker kingdom morally. Mm. There will be moral depravity. They won't just be weak in military might, but there will be a morality that will be depraved in the kingdoms as they will come because there is a war in heaven between Lucifer and Michael and Lucifer was sent down to deceive the whole world. What does this deception? Don't have faith in God and disobey his commandments. When you don't have faith in God and disobey his commandments, it leads to spiritual degeneracy and moral depravity. So the question we started with is, what's going on? It was the question that the king woke up with on the tip of his lips. What's going on? Trying to answer his dream. And Daniel answers the question exactly what's going on. Let us go further. He made you the ruler of all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. Next verse. You are the head of the earth, but after your kingdom comes to an end. Now that's where the kingdom, the king went crazy. Well, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> My kingdom come to an end. There's nobody that really thinks that their stuff is going to come to an end. Every man as he comes blossoms in his youth with his bold chest pumping up and his body such as they were. He never thinks that that kingdom is going to come to an end. But you just go down 60 years a little later. That chest, that kingdom has come to an end. Somebody ought to say amen. After that kingdom will come to an end, a kingdom inferior to yours will rise and take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. We know the history that is written down by many great historians that there was a kingdom called Babylon, and there was a subsequent kingdom called Medes and Persia, and there was a subsequent kingdom called Greece. Secular historians have given veracity to this, that this Bible story is true. Some may argue, but maybe this was written after that. No, we have archaeologists that have gone and proven that Daniel's story was written before any of the subsequent kingdoms took place. What does this mean? That the Bible can be trusted as the sure word of God, and that God does answer secrets and interprets dreams. Somebody ought to say amen. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron. That represents Rome. We know that Rome was known for metallurgy. It was the kingdom where which iron was really perfected, and that's how they conquered the entire world. They made weapons of iron. They made boats of iron. They wore iron. It was called the Iron Kingdom. Well, that kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. That was Rome. And then finally, the feet and toes that you saw, shaped like a man, combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. 
Never again after Rome will one nation control the entire planet. All right. And we know that after Rome came the nations of Europe. 400 years of control by European Western expansion. We've seen the nations of England control the Latin Caribbean and Africa. We've seen Portugal control portions of Africa. We've seen Spain control the Latin Americas. Eventually, you will begin to see that the European nations that control the world right now are the divided kingdoms that are spoken of right here in Daniel chapter 2. We are grappling right now after 400 years of what we call racism and white supremacy and didn't realize that Daniel predicted that this would be the last kingdom on the planet. There is no country in the planet that's not been touched by European expansion. And so we understand now why the Trayvon Martin case makes sense. Because we're living in a culture and a context that is still controlled by the 400 years of European domination and we have not come to the next kingdom. Prophecy is sure. And so now that you're getting your headache, you begin to realize that you're just like Daniel. Most of us are just simply like those same people that were controlled in Babylon, like Daniel was controlled. We are controlled by the dominant forces that we cannot have any influence over. But I know somebody yes, that despite where you come from, what you look like, and how much money you have, you still have access to somebody that's greater than the kingdoms of the world today. Rich, poor, black, white, you can still have direct access to the king of kings. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Daniel goes on beyond that. The mixture of iron clay also showed that these kingdoms would try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances. The queen of England marrying the queen of France, and the queen of Portugal trying to marry the queen of Spain. Forming alliances with each other through intermarriage, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. Even today, the European Union is a fragile union. No matter how they try to pull it together, it's still just divided nations of Europe. The next verse. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Amen. Friends, what's going on? We are in the throes of the last kingdom of Earth's history. What's going on? Children are disobedient. Men are more lovers of themselves than lovers of God. What's going on? Sickness is rampant throughout the world. The economy cannot be stabilized. What is going on? We are right now preparing for that final kingdom that Daniel spoke of to come. The kingdom of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Somebody ought to say amen if you're today. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Amen. We are not playing games. We are not just coming for a miracle just to get paid. We need a miracle so that we can make it into that final kingdom and make sure that we will not be crushed by that kingdom, but that kingdom we shall inhabit. Amen. But friends, turn with me, if you will, to the Bible. You will look at Ephesians chapter 6. What book did I say? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians is a right turn after Galatians. Yeah. Somebody said, but where's Galatians? <laughs> Well, Galatians is a left turn before Ephesians and a right turn after 2 Corinthians. Somebody say amen. I know it's been a long time since you've been turning pages, but we're going to use the Bible throughout this series. Is that okay? Yeah. Because I think the Bible has the answer to what's going on. Well, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, 
All together? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, you must stand. What's going on? We have a world that now is under spiritual anarchy. The team of the devil is now mounted up. After having been kicked out of heaven and kicked down to earth, the king of the earth is now, the prince of this earth now is Jesus, who is claiming his territory because the Bible says that he came down and he took back over dominion of this world. But the devil is angry. Because he doesn't want any of us to know the secret and the miracle. This next three weeks, we're going to discuss the miracle that can be yours so that you can be in the kingdom of Jesus and begin to see things popping off in your life like you've never seen before. Amen. Daniel, Amen. sitting there, poor, slave, yet he had a miracle. Late one night, a knock came on his door and he became the prime minister of entire Babylon. You know there's a secret and there's a miracle for you. There's a secret to get access to power and there's a miracle that's waiting to happen. But if you don't know the secret and in order to experience the miracle, you're going to be continuously left suffering, fighting the wrong fights and the wrong battle. You're going to be getting involved with political warfare. No answer. You're going to try to educate yourself. No answer. You've tried to get the money. No answer. You've tried to get power. No answer. You've tried sex. No answer. You need to experience a miracle. Amen. But you need to know the secret. Right. My friend, let me let you know, it's not simply a secret and a miracle. There is a time that this will all wind up. And the final kingdom will be established. And that is the kingdom of God. Put on the full armor of God, for you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. What's going on? A spiritual battle between good and evil that is about to come to a screeching halt, yes. and you need to be in the right position, Hallelujah. the right place, at the right time, with the right person, and his name is Jesus. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Give God some praise in here today. There's somebody here today that wants to know more about what's going on. But not just know it, because there are some who increase in knowledge, but they don't get to any fulfillment of their knowledge. You want to make a move, a God move, so that you can be on the right side at the end of this great battle. As bowed and eyes closed. If you're that person says, I want to make sure that I get my miracle and I need to know the secret, I just want you to take a stand. You just want to make sure that you get your miracle. You're going to come to discover the secret. Just take a, just raise your hand where you are. I want to know the secret and I want to have a miracle. Amen. 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 If you raise your hand, stand. If you haven't, please remain seated. If you raise your hand. Just stand. I want to pray specifically for you. Our God and our Father, today, we want the miracles to start pouring out. Lord, you said you wish above all things that we prosper and be in good health. We want health, we want prosperity, even as our soul will prosper. Daniel received good health because he was obedient. But he also received prosperity as a miracle. We want prosperity, we want health, but we want most of all, Lord, our souls to prosper, that we may be saved in that kingdom. Those who have stood today, there is something on their minds. There's a person who has a health issue, and they've stood because they need a miracle. There's somebody who has a family member, they stood because that person needs a miracle. There's somebody here that's in a relationship that's not working, they need a miracle. 
There's a marriage that's on the fragile border of being busted up. They need a miracle. There's a child that's still running the street outside of the ark of safety. They need a miracle. There's somebody whose finances have just about been wiped out. They need a miracle. God, you are not just a God that wants us to get to heaven. You want heaven to get into us. And because heaven comes into us, it attracts the blessings that are temporal as well as spiritual. Lord, we need a miracle. I want to thank you for what you have done and about to do. They want to claim these promises that you've given us in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that everyone say, Amen. Put your hands together.